Well, that was certainly a trailer. I mean, it was absolutely amazing. I had no idea that they would go so hard on it. They really didn't have to. We were all in anyway, but they totally pulled out all the stops. The trailer has everything. Familiar scenes from the source material, exciting reveals, and tons of teases regarding brand new content. Round two of the all-out war between Shinigami and Quincy's begins indeed. But the real fun for us as fans, at least as far as I'm concerned, is to be had right now. Now that we've seen the trailer, we've watched it countless times by now, no doubt it's time to really pick it apart. We're going to deep dive into the new trailer for the second core of the Thousand Year Blood War arc anime, scouring it frame by frame and laying it all bare before our very eyes. We'll compare existing scenes to their appearance in the source material, analyse and explore new shots, sequences and dialogue and unravel the secrets of the trailer itself. What are they hiding? What plans do the team have for parts 3 and 4 in the future, and how do they possibly tie into what we see here? In many ways, Core 2 was always going to be extremely exciting, even more so than the first part of the anime, because it feels like a jumping off point. I've said it before, but Core 1 covered the section of the Thousand Year Blood War arc, often considered the most cohesive, the most tight-knit. There wasn't much that really needed or warranted amending. But here, we're in uncharted territory now, and I think the trailer confirms that. If you've seen my video on the second Quincy invasion, you'll know that this is the beginning of the true war. From this point onwards, it's one huge titanic battle for the fate of the universe. So, without further ado, let's break down the trailer piece by piece and prepare ourselves for the return of the anime in July. But before we get started on the video, guys, if you haven't hit subscribe yet, make sure to do that now for more Bleach content like this every single week. And if you enjoyed the video, make sure to give it a thumbs up when you're done with it to help support me and the channel. And if you want to take that support for me another step further, I do also have a Patreon as well. And as always, I need to give an everlasting shout out and say a huge thank you to every single person supporting me over there on Patreon. As always, it really does mean the absolute world to me. And of course, if you hadn't guessed, this video will be chock full of spoilers for the upcoming Thousand Year Blood War arc anime based on what we know of the source material of things yet to come. So you've been warned beforehand. Before we begin, I have to say that upon many re-watches of the trailer, I'm kind of blown away by the amount of new content here. I think we knew there would be some, certainly a few scenes here and there, but this trailer hints at potentially major additions, and that's what I'm most excited for in general. And so, the trailer begins. Immediately, the prevailing colour scheme this time around seems to be an icy blue, obviously reminiscent of the Quincy's themselves, their shadowy palace of Silburn, and the immense influence that they will have on this particular section of the story. Story. Considering we see at the end of the trailer that the Thousand Year Blood War logo is this same shade of blue, can we assume that the new opening for this core will heavily feature this colour throughout as well, just like how the first opening ran with that bright pink theme? It seems logical to me and I'm very excited about that. Here's hoping for a pretty Vandenreich heavy opening. As the opening titles disappear, we're treated to an awesome looking shot of Yuha Baha clasping Uryu's Quincy cross in his hand, the Quincy King's blood running down it as the church bells ring in the background, that fantastic Vandenreich motif. We know that the Vandenreich are essentially an extremist faction of Quincy, and this is their almost occult indoctrination ritual to become a Sternritter. This actual shot of Yuha Baha and Uryu's cross is brand new and looks to be an extension of the final scene of chapter 543, where Uryu drinks his new master's blood, thereby gaining a shrift and completing the vampiric ritual to become a member of the Sternritter. It makes sense that the trailer would open with this. Chapter 543 will likely be the very first chapter covered 
in this new core unless they finish up the second half of 542 first. And so, the initial episode will be almost entirely centred around the Quincy, depending on how much new content they add. And of course, we'll get into that in a minute. Anyway, it seems likely that Yuhabaha's blood will run down Uryu's cross and into the small dish that Uryu later drinks from, thus completing the process as Yuhabaha bestows him with the shrift A. This scene is combined with a few shots from earlier in chapter 543. Yuhabaha makes the grand announcement to the Sternritter that he is proclaiming Uryu as his successor to the Empire. Both the shots of Yuhabaha's mouth and Uryu's face are taken straight from the source material here before we get the title itself. Up next is where things immediately get very interesting. In the trailer, Basby is seen punching a wall in anger after finding out that Uryu, a complete stranger, has been made the heir to the Vandenreich. This is slightly altered from the source material. In the chapter, Basby is seen walking with several other Sternritter, all of whom aren't seen up close until later. Instead of punching a wall, we see that Basby takes a bottle of some kind of alcohol, presumably, and launches it at a nearby pillar instead. Immediately after this, we see a shot of Bambietta bathed in a crimson glow. Although the dialogue has her saying, I don't care, this is stupid, I don't think that's actually what she's saying. In fact, if I had to guess, this shot this scene is from chapter 544, when she blows a hole in a nearby wall and then states that she's worried about the future of the Vandenreich. Although the expression is slightly different, the red glow looks like her Reiatsu, which is why I lined it up with one of her blasts. Could easily be wrong though, as she definitely doesn't look as concerned here as she is in the original chapter. However, up next, things get very interesting indeed, and I think this is where we see the biggest changes starting to crop up. First of all, we get a brand new group shot of the Bambis all either sitting on or around an ornate table. At first, I thought this was the Sternritter meeting table glimpsed later, but it's actually not. The chairs are a different design, and as we'll see later, the table itself is totally different too. Following this, we get a shot of Master Masculine and BG9 staring at another Quincy hidden in the foreground, while the Bambis are visible in the background in the same pose as the previous shot. So, to cut a long story short, here is what I think is happening and how it differs from the original chapter. In the source material, events play out like this. Yuhabaha summons all the Sternritter to a massive auditorium where he declares Uryu is his successor. After this, the Sturmritter go their separate ways, and we see Basby, Kangdu, BG9, and Mask all discussing the meeting as they walk down a hallway before running into Hashwolf. I think it's going to be a fair bit different here in the anime, however. It looks like Yuhabaha will still make his announcement, but then, rather than dispersing, I think the majority of Sternritter will instead move to what looks like a communal lounge area. It's here that I think Basby punches the wall. He is probably the hidden figure that Mask and BG9 are currently sat with. And that's possibly Kangdu next to them, though maybe not, as he doesn't look to be a part of their conversation. Either way, Lil Toto also looks to get a line or two here, which would also be totally new. This shift in structure makes me wonder how the next chapter might be impacted. If this is our actual introduction to the Bambis properly, then how will their first appearance in chapter 544 play out? The first core removed a lot of the more, shall we say, suggestive content, so maybe Bambietta's next appearance will be heavily toned down or even completely cut. Anyway, back to the trailer at hand. The next shot shows us Basby confronting Hashwolf just as he does in chapter 543. However, as we can see here, there's a door open behind Hashwolf which isn't there in the source material due to the fact that there they meet in a hallway. What this tells me is that Hashwolf most likely enters the communal lounge room after everybody else during their conversation and is immediately confronted by Basby. 
By the way, we get a few disconnected lines of dialogue here. Someone says this battle isn't appealing at all, which I think is probably my boy Askin talking to Myri about how he's not going to be able to defeat him, or he's going to be difficult to defeat him anyway, though I'm not certain. Later, we get a new line from Uryu as he bows before Yuhabaha, saying he's severed his ties to everything, re-establishing his commitment to the Vandenreich. Uryu bowing before Yuhabaha like this is a new, more dynamic angle on the ending of 543 as Uryu drinks his blood. The scene after this, however, is another big one, and the first really exciting talking point of the trailer. We're treated to a brand new shot of Hashwolf sitting in a decorated chair and extending a hand out menacingly towards the camera. With his sword clasped in front of him, it really creates a fantastic image evoking the Holy Knights Templar or something like that, and it's imagery I wish Kubo himself had done more with in the source material. However, it doesn't end there. The camera pans out to reveal an enormous silver meeting table, members of the Sturmeter gathered around it on plush chairs. This is huge. This is, again, completely new. The Sternritter never meet like this in one place on screen in the source material. Though they're all implied to be present for Yuhabaha's announcement, we never get an actual gathering as they are presented here. Initially, I thought this scene was following on from that announcement, but now I'm less sure. I actually think this table meeting is a totally separate moment, completely disconnected from the events of chapter 543 and 544. Here, it looks like Hashwolf is giving the Quincy a final pep talk of sorts before the second invasion begins, so I imagine this is quite literally just at the cusp of the battle itself, probably the day after Yuhabaha's big announcement. And as we see this meeting unfold, Hashwolf has new dialogue break the Soul Reaper's hope along with their Zanpak toe and engrave true defeat into their minds and bodies, which not only sounds awesome, but also sounds like he's giving the Sternritter a pre-battle speech, most likely at this meeting. It does feel like this new scene is being made to intentionally mirror the Espada. Some poses are even shared between characters, for instance, with Askin sitting like Stark and Bambietta sitting like Neutra. But that makes sense to me. The anime is a revamped opportunity to really increase the mindshare of the Vandenreich as Bleach villains, and reiterating some minor Espada comparisons is a good start. Some small things of note here. Every single living Sternritter is present here save for three, Pernida, Leal, and Gerard, confirming that Gremmy was never a member of the Schutzstoffel as some predicted. As I mentioned in my reaction, I'm surprised actually to even see Gremmy here, as he was meant to be locked in a cage beneath Silburn, and I'm kind of surprised so many of the Sturmiter are actually comfortable to even be in the same room as him. That being said, I've taken issue on the channel before with the fact that Gremmy exists within the vacuum of Zaraki's fight, so it's nice to see him appearing earlier. And speaking of which, this will act as a new first reveal for some of these characters such as Gremmy, such as Pepe and Nyanzol. For characters like Nyanzol in particular, it's nice he'll at least have a little bit of foreshadowing before his arrival much later on. By the way, Giselle and Pepe are sat across from each other. That's a twisted duo being kept at the end of the table if I've ever seen one. And of course, not unexpected, but the Sternritter are sat in alphabetical order, with Askin heading up the table on one side and Robert Akutrone on the other. We then get a close-up of Hashwalt's face as he glances up, presumably at everyone else, before beginning his speech. We then get a brief shot of Hyosu freaking out. This is presumably from chapter 547 when the Seireite is replaced by the Vandenreich city. Hyosu is featured prominently during that sequence, so it makes sense to showcase him here. The next few shots are again quite important. We actually get to see the initiation of the transformation of Seireite as it appears appears in chapter 546 as the Quincy shadows erupt from a small paper windmill in Seireite and then begin to cover the entirety of the Shakon Maku, signalling the beginning of the second invasion. The shot of the little windmill is new, but it's the next shot that's the most important. One of the biggest points of contention and debate 
to come from the new trailer is the prevalence of the blood red sky as a backdrop for the battle itself. A lot of people like it, some people don't really like it, and I can totally understand both viewpoints here. There are scenes where I think it does look unfinished due to how blank and featureless it actually is as a background, while at the same time I do appreciate how unique it's going to make this battle look and feel, and how sinister it is to drench the battlefield in a crimson bloodied glow. One thing I will say though is it's clearly being done for artistic direction over anything else, because it doesn't really make sense to me that a shadow world like the one the Quincy Occupy would have a a red veil surrounding it. Surely that darkness that covers the shack on Maku would be a total pitch black. A lot of people in the comments of my reaction brought up the fact that this is possibly just being done for artistic effect for the trailer itself, but I think that's unlikely and this shot is the key reason why. We can see the veil of shadows creeping up the shack on Maku as the switch begins and it's quite clearly already the same colour. It's that same deep red. The entirety of Seireite is being draped in a crimson shroud essentially, which I don't think is how anyone envisioned this change in the source material, but it's interesting nonetheless. Not only that, but at numerous points in the trailer we can see characters have a red gleam to their outline, something I doubt would be added if the red sky was only going to be used for trailer purposes. What will be interesting to see is if it remains totally featureless moving forward. As we can see in future chapters, for example, 559, clouds and even the moon are visible beneath this new sky. Up next we've got some new ominous dialogue for Ichibe where he states that a thousand years of peace have made the Shinigami weak. This is a cool line, and it shows that Ichibe has a similar way of thinking to even Yuhabaha himself, with absolutely no tolerance for weakness. As he says this, we get what I think is a new shot of him. Behind him is likely the door to his inner sanctum, where characters like Ichigo, Renji, and Rukia are trained. And speaking of Ichigo, we get a new close-up of his face. What's interesting about this is he's wearing his full bring collar still. The last time we see him wear that in the source material is when he gets his Zanpak toe forged by Oetsu, which of course we've already seen in the anime. If I were to guess, I would assume this is Ichigo speaking to either Senjumaru or Ichibe about the next stage of his training, before he would go on to lose this look for good, as we'll see later on in the trailer. And by later on in the trailer, I mean right now, as in a new shot, Ichigo sheds his tattered robes, the sleeves of which were destroyed when he pulled his Zanpak toe from the forge before, before picking up his new swords in Ichibe's sanctum. This last shot is taken straight from the very first page of chapter 547, where Ichigo is presumably about to begin Ichibe's training. There's another line of new dialogue from Ichibe where he says they are sure to come again in the near future, again presumably instructing Ichigo and basically telling him the reality that the Quincy will attack at some point before he gets started. Afterwards we get another new shot that's quite interesting to me. Basby, identifiable by his boots, is leading other Sturmitter into battle, it seems. And I'm guessing they're Sturmitter because Soldat don't have outfits like that, they don't have shoes like that, they all wear the standard issue Vandenreich black military boots. And this must be early in the fight because Basby's still wearing his cloak. So, what's going on here? When we first see Basby during the second invasion in the source material, he's already running into battle against the 10th Division on his own. So it's possible we see a few Sturmitter go their separate ways before the fight actually gets going. Meanwhile, the dialogue overlaid is from Yuhabaha when he says this drowsy battle, so uplifting and full of hope, ends here, and is taken straight from chapter 554 when the Sternritter are able to release their holy forms once more after losing the stolen Bankai. There's a new shot of Uryu straight after this which is intriguing. He opens his eyes and from the angle and the way he opens them I wonder if he's lying down perhaps in bed in his own quarters, maybe he was asleep. He's definitely in silver and we can tell that from the lighting and the colours. If he's pondering things alone, then Core 2 is going to continue the trend started by Part 1 of increasing Uryu's screen time. And this is immediately juxtaposed with a shot of Hashwolf, which could really be from anywhere. The lighting would make you think initially that it's not in Silburn, but then for whatever reason the lighting during the Sternritter meeting 
is different to how the rest of the Quincy Palace looks, so it could be then. It could also be from chapter 565, God Like You, which focuses a lot on Hashworth, and he looks rather sinister in a few of those panels too. This is then followed up by another shot of Yuhabaha, which I believe is new. Based on what we've seen so far, I have to assume again, this is from the end of 543, or perhaps even the start of 544, where he talks with Uryu about his new position. As we reach the end of the first half or so of the trailer, we get a new shot of Yuhabaha, Hashwolf, and Uryu standing atop Silburn. We can tell it's atop Silburn and not the tower they'd later find themselves on because of the arches on either side of them. So presumably this is a new angle on their arrival in the transformed Seireite from chapter 546. One small thing I want to add as well is with the anime kind of doubling down on Uryu becoming Yuhabaha's heir, his successor, I do wonder if they'll actually do a little more with this plot point than Kubo did in the source material. A very cool detail, by the way, is that during all of the previous section from Ichibei's dialogue to this final shot of the three Quincy, the sound of a ticking clock can be heard, presumably counting down the days until Yuhabaha regains control of the world as per the Kaiser Gesang. It also sounds like the start of the Quincy Shadow sound effect, again foreshadowing their takeover. We're then treated to a few dynamic title cards playing up the fact that this is round two of the all-out war between Shinigami and Quincy, which is very exciting. From here, we flash through some scenes quite quickly. We immediately see the first of what will become a few shots of Ichigo drenched in a pallid green light. He's sweating heavily and panting hard, the result of Ichibei's training, the sequence of which does look oddly sinister. Of course, all of this is totally new. We unfortunately skipped Ichibei's training completely in the source material, likely the most important of all of the parts of the Zero Division, so it's great to see it brought to life here. Then, carrying on with the theme of Ichibei's training, we see Renji and Rukia training in a shot taken from chapter 545, when the sudden ringing of the bell breaks them from their concentration. This is followed up with quick close-ups of both Orohime and Chad, appearing as they do in chapter 546 during their training at the Nigal Ruins in Waco Mundo. This is then followed up by another new shot, this time from Waco Mundo, showing Nell messing around with Dondachaka and Peshe as they're watched in secret by a hooded figure, who is clearly none other than Grimjo himself, now sporting his Thousand Year Blood War arc outfit. This shot at least seems to imply we might be getting a little more from the goings on in Waco Mundo than we did in the source material. I, for one, would love to see more training scenes for Chad and Orohime, though more than that, I'd like to see Chad especially actually do something. Orohime's pretty useful later on, but Chad especially needs to actually do something. Considering they still seem to be trying to at least somewhat hide Grimjo's appearance, I'm not expecting him to be heavily involved here. The next shot is kind of weird. It's the exact same smirk from Yuhabaha that was featured in episode 1, just with different lighting. I wonder if they're actually reusing it or if it's just for the trailer this time. Anyway, after this we get a rather interesting shot, and I'll be honest, I'm not sure where it takes place. We see the research and development department in a panic as numerous screens all turn red, producing some kind of warning sign. My immediate thought was this was during the first stage of the invasion and their technology was going haywire as the Seireite was being replaced. What's interesting about this, however, and why I don't think that can be accurate, is the room we're seeing here is Mayuri's hidden light-filled laboratory that would later be used as the Shinigami's last remaining stronghold. This room isn't revealed until after he appears behind Askin in chapter 547 once the switch has already taken place, so I'm not sure what this is. The other scenario that's possible is that this is taking place during chapter 552 when Kisuke arrives and convinces Mayuri to let them work together in there. But then, what are the warning signs for? Unless it's just supposed to be them all getting set up in there, getting ready to go. Let me know what you think this particular shot is showing. It could, of course, be connected to something completely new as well. Speaking of new, up next we see a mass gathering of Soldat before one of them rushes an unknown character with his sword. While in reality, I think we all know who that is, I actually think it could be actually one of two options, and we'll get into that in a bit. Next is a brief shot of Kisuke Urahara's 
eye, his only appearance in the trailer, and this must be from the final page of chapter 552, where he reveals that the stolen hollow-fied Bankai will act as poison to the Quincy. Afterwards, we get a very cool, very symbolic shot of a Quincy cross completely soaked in blood. I wonder what this is from, because it does look very abstract. That's not the style of cross on the back of the Sturmitzer cloak, so I don't think this is a literal scene. Could it be a shot from the new opening, perhaps? Or is it going to be used as part of an explanation or speech, but I'm not sure which one? It could be from, again, God Like You, where Hashwath explains that all of the Sturmitzer live and die for Yuha Baha, so it's possible that that's referencing that somehow. There is one other option, however, for what this could be. It could be Yuhabaha's blood running on the small dish as Uryu drinks it, as that dish has a similar style Vandenreich emblem emblazoned upon it. Anyway, that's immediately followed by Ichigo in that sickly emerald light again, still hunched over, so perhaps straight after the previous shot of his mouth. His eyes are wide and he's looking pretty scared. Now, I have more to say about this, and I think it could relate to why he's looking that way. It could be as simple as Ichibei's gruelling training, or it could be a bit more, but for now, let's move on. Up next, we have a different angle on the shot of Basby erupting into flames from chapter 548, and his dialogue is taken from that moment as well. I have to say, I love how this looks. Initially, I was kind of hoping for Basby's flames to be blue before the new anime even came out, but seeing them like this here, I think it looks great. This is then followed up by the shot of Hitsugaya and Matsumoto from the end of 547 when they confront Basby himself. And I have to say, static like this, I don't think this looks fantastic, particularly Matsumoto's face, but it's no big deal. Based on Basby's facial expression and his lack of cloak, I think the following shot is when he tells Hitsugaya he's making him mad enough to use two fingers before the trailer transitions back a step again to when Basby has his cloak on, meaning this one has to be from their clash in 548. I love this shot. It was in the original teaser trailer, but now the fire effects have been finished and it looks amazing. Interestingly though, whatever this is, it seems to be at least slightly new, as Basby never explicitly launches an attack like this, so either it's a slightly different angle on a shot from the source material, in which case I feel it's most likely this section on screen now, or this is a brand new extension to the fight between Hitsugaya and Basby, which of course would be fantastic to see. Though if any of Hitsugaya's fights are going to be extended, I would really hope it would be Kang Do's. This is followed up by a shot of Hitsugaya going in for a strike, which again could either be from a newly extended portion of the fight, or just a slightly amended version of a moment from the chapter, i.e. here perhaps. Straight after this, we see Hitsugaya generating a wall of ice with a slash. This is during his retreat from Basby, as we can see blood on his chin and a flower of ice where he was blasted by Burner Finger 1, trying to stem the wound. Over the top of this sequence is Hitsugaya's new dialogue, where he asks why would the winning side beg for their lives? That's really interesting to me. Of course it isn't going to be Basby doing the begging, so I can only assume the battle with Kang Du will be extended somewhat. What's weird about this is Kang Du doesn't even beg for his life when threatened by Hashwolf, so is it really him begging Hitsugaya? It would feel out of character for him to do so, but I'm not sure what else is going on here. It's possible that Hitsugaya's Quincy enemy tells Hitsugaya to beg for his life, and Hitsugaya claims that they are the winning side, and therefore he has no reason to. This is followed up by Rangiku mocking her captain and readying her Zanpak toe, all scenes taken from chapter 548, where she and Hitsugaya begin to work together against Basby. The anime has retained, and I'd argue even emphasised, Rangiku's strange-looking face in this scene, where it really doesn't look anything like her. I can't help but feel like this trailer was made for people who have read the sword material already, as the next shot shows Hitsugaya with his Bankai back. This particular shot is taken from chapter 553, when Kang Du launches Hitsugaya's own ice at him, only for it to deflect itself away. I know we saw this in the first invasion, but I do love the detail that Kang Du's ice is a different colour from Hitsugaya's. Kang himself is then shown driving an aerial kick towards Hitsugaya before looking up into the air. 
These are both taken straight from chapter 553, where Kang attacks the captain and then says that pantheism is not really for him. The next shot of Kang Du revealing his claws is from chapter 552, when he introduces himself, and we also get to hear him speak for the first time, as well as BG-9. However, BG-9's line and shot don't actually match. His dialogue is from his interrogation of Omaida, which would come later in the trailer, but the shot of him emerging from the dust here is when he arrives on the battlefield in 548. You all know this already, as I've said before, but I sincerely hope both Kangdu and BG-9 get extended fights. It's not too surprising that Hitsugaya's fight in particular is a big focus in this trailer, with it being the first real fight of the second invasion. We then get to see a bit more of BG-9's battle as he pins Omida to the wall with his tendrils, and as for the next shot, it's a tough one to gauge, but it could be when Omida is about to be blasted by BG-9's minigun with the fiery orange glow being the muzzle flash as it heats up and prepares to fire, but I'll be honest, I'm not convinced. I wonder if this is actually taken from chapter 553, and is when Omida tells Soifon he's ready to hold her steady as she prepares her Bankai. That way, the missile firing up would be the source of the immense light, and I think that makes more sense. The incredible amount of smoke, in fact, may mean that it's actually already being fired. We get to see Soifon charging up and then activating her completed Shunko before slamming her fist into BG-9. All of this is straight from the original chapter of 549, and this is what I mean by this trailer showing a lot. I mean, right there, in the space of about three seconds, the trailer has shown, I would say, about a third of Soifon's only fight in this arc. I also hope the shot of her activating her Shunko looks a little better in the actual episode. I think it's far too wispy here, whereas in the source material it's quite clearly voluminous and powerful, and obviously takes the shape of a pair of full butterfly wings. In the anime, it kind of just looks like thin smoke. The next shot featuring Mask Damasculin throwing his arms into the air is likely this shot from chapter 559, after he thinks he's beaten Hisagi, Ikaku, and Yumichika. Mask would make this pose again later on, but he's cloaked here in the trailer, so I think it's this moment. In fact, Mask removes his cloak as soon as his confrontation with Kensei begins, so I think this next shot of him lunging forwards is from a slightly extended battle between himself and Hisagi, and maybe even Ikaku and Yumichika too, based on a shot much later on. But this is probably where he comes in and clothes lines Hisagi in chapter 560. Up next, we have Mairi and Nemu emerging from their hidden lab in 547, wearing their sunsuits. The effects on Mairi's actually look really good here, and again have been updated and improved since he appeared in the initial teaser trailer. And the close-up of his face is taken from this scene here. Up next, we finally get properly introduced to none other than Askin Naklavar in what I think is a brief combination of scenes. The shot of him shrugging from behind is from chapter 550, as is him telling Myri that their situation is still dire. Then finally, there's this shot of him glancing over his shoulder, which I believe is this panel in the source material. But then, of course, we have probably the biggest scene of the entire trailer. Shinji Hirako is going to use his Bankai. Of course, Shinji uses his Bankai in the light novel Can't Fear Your Own World, but to see him actually get to use it during an arc from the source material is so incredibly exciting, and it oddly legitimises it in a way in my eyes. Even though Can't Fear Your Own World is canon, it's weird. The fact that he's using it during the Thousand Year Blood War arc just feels so much better to me. But it's so great to see Shinji, who is a really prominent character, finally get his chance to shine. As I've joked before, he does absolutely nothing of merit in the arc, despite getting a decent amount of screen time. And this also means we'll see the Bankai of all three of the Vizard captains in the Thousand Year Blood War this time around. But what's actually going down here, and when does this take place? Obviously, this is an all-new scene, but I think there's a great chance it spins off of a scene from the source material. In chapter 581, which would put this as being by far the furthest point into the story we've seen in the trailer so far, Omida finds himself surrounded on all sides by Soldat while trying to rescue Soifon and his sister. 
In the source material, he's rescued by Hinamori and Shinji who come to his aid. I'm thinking this is an extension of that scene, but just with considerably more soldat. Let me take you back to that earlier shot of the soldat where I said it could be one of two people they're facing. Well, I think this shot of the soldat is from the opening to chapter 581, and this foremost soldat is charging at Omaida. He and probably a few others will then be taken out by Hinamori's Tobiyume, just like in the chapter, at which point Hirako will instruct her to leave and look after Omaida and the others. Which then brings us to the trailer. Interestingly, the soldat on the front row all have their bows drawn. I don't think we've ever seen a soldat use a bow in the source material, and by soldat, I mean an elite soldier in the full gas mask and beret regalia. We do see a few low-tier soldiers using bows much earlier on. But the soldat usually preferred to use their sabres, so maybe they decided Shinji was too dangerous to engage in close quarters. Interestingly as well, there's a pile of dead Shinigami on the floor. This is the only detail that makes me think it could be a totally separate scene to 581, as there's no dead officers at the start of that chapter. Regardless, Shinji activates his Bankai in an amazing looking moment where he looks absolutely devilish. Shinji's line here is extremely similar to what he says in Can't Fear Your Own World before activating Bankai, which we heard in the original teaser and was what made me think he was going to show his Bankai in Thousand Year Blood War initially. But the screen spins around before we get this incredible shot of his eye bathed in a golden light. He's clearly saying Bankai when he lifts Sakanare to his face. The shot of his eye is a bit later, as we can see he's already been encased within the flower of his Bankai itself, meaning the effect is about to activate, or already has. I have a bit more to say about this and the implications of including it here, but we'll touch on that later. Moving on, we get to see Sage in Komamura, and again, this is another fight where they seem to show virtually all of it here in the trailer. Unfortunately, I don't think we'll get to see any of his battle with his grandfather, which is a bit of a shame, as it delivers Komamura a much-needed win, but we do see him preparing to pull his heart out. All of this is from the flashback in chapter 556, and it looks pretty chapter accurate to me. The shot of Dangai Jaw landing on the ground is actually after he has dealt the winning blow to Bambietta. In fact, you can see her falling from the sky behind him. The next shot of Dangai Jaw, which is from behind as he gives chase to Bambietta, is technically new, though I think it's basically just a reverse angle on this shot from the chapter. I'm honestly not sure how I feel about Dangai Joy being CG. It feels like it definitely loses something, at least from what we see in the trailer. Kokujo Tengen Myo always used to look so amazing and feel so grandiose in the original anime, so it'll be interesting to see how this fares in comparison. Afterwards, we get a very small tease of human Komamura before the scene switches to Kensei and Rose. Interestingly, the trailer has so far been playing out in chronological order in accordance with the source material, showing us first Toshiro vs. Basby and Kangdu, then Soifon vs. BG9, then breaking it up with Shinji's Barnakai, which is weird, maybe indicating it appears earlier than I think, before carrying on with the next few fights. We see a few brief shots of Kensei and Rose, including a shot of Kensei from chapter 560, which looks almost unchanged from the original teaser trailer. This is then followed up with a bit of a showcase for the Bambi, specifically showing a fair bit of Bambietta in her Volsten dig, which by the way looks absolutely wonderful. I love the effects used on the holy forms, that glittering angelic light works really well, and of course it's great to see they've committed to giving them their own individual colours thankfully. I believe Robert's holy form in the first core has actually been retroactively changed for the Blu-ray release, which is great. We then see the Bambis from chapter 558, where Giselle would eventually kill Bambietta and enslave her. It's definitely creepy hearing Bambietta pleading to her overlaid on top. Next up is a somewhat new shot of Kyoraku, though I think it's just an angle change on this moment from chapter 559 where Hashwalth shatters Nanao's first barrier. I'd love for this to be turned into something of an actual fight, though I don't think that's going to happen personally. This is capped off by the exchange between them as Hashwalth is summoned away, which tells me Kangdu and BG9 are still going to suffer the same fate as before. Now, I don't mind that, 
so long as they get a better, more extended fight before being killed for no reason. And then we're treated to some more brand new scenes of Ichigo's intensive training in the inner sanctum of Ichibei's palace. This spooky, eerie green and yellow light works really well here. It's kind of difficult though to tell exactly what's going on. It almost looks like there's grass on the floor in front of him, but I'm not sure exactly. Anyway, the next shot, which looks again incredible, shows four strands of colourful Rayatsu swirling around Ichigo as he staggers in place. As many people pointed out on my reaction video, this is likely representative of the four key spiritual races of Bleach, all of which exist within Ichigo. Red is presumably Shinigami, blue is Quincy, which leads me to believe there could be separate streams for Hollow and Fullbring, or if not, we can assume Hollow and Fullbring are mixed together as green and human is gold. But again, is it likely to be human or is it likely to be separate streams for Hollow and Fullbring? Either way, it's a really fantastic, mystical and even divine image, especially as he's surrounded almost completely by talismans draped from the walls. And again, I really like that they are hammering home the fact that Ichigo is a perfect hybrid of all the races. That explains so much about him. It's interesting that he stumbles. Whatever he's been doing here is taking its toll. With this new emphasis on Ichigo's training, I hope we actually get to see the fruits of it a little bit more. Things do get very interesting here. There are very fast, blink and you'll miss it, flashes of a grainy image as we see Ichigo, his eyes suddenly opening wide. These images are unmistakably of none other than the Soul King himself. While it's difficult to tell for sure, it almost looks like the process of his mutilation and imprisonment played out in stages. We see Rayo's right arm being removed, as well as a close-up look at his legless form before a shot of him in his crystal prison. The first image doesn't seem to fit this sequence, as he already seems to be split apart at that point, though there's some kind of what looks like fire surrounding him. Anyway, this is of course extremely exciting. The Soul King's history is certainly what I've been waiting to see for many years, and again, of note, it was introduced in Can't Fear Your Own World. Now, as to where we learn about this in terms of the anime, I think Ichibei could be telling Ichigo the story of what happened to Reo during his training, hence Ichigo's wide-eyed, scared look earlier. And that makes sense to me narratively too. It adds value to showing Ichigo's training if you also talk about the king, though a part of me wonders if it's too early for that as well. By this point, we haven't actually seen Reo in full, so we don't know that he's limbless. Wouldn't this completely spoil that reveal? Interestingly, Ichibei's line here is almost the same as his dialogue from chapter 555 when Ichigo leaves the palace. He says Ichigo has become a true Shinigami, but in the anime they add a new extra line too, as if to once again place emphasis on Ichigo's true nature, as Ichibei adds, one who has surpassed the ordinary Shinigami. And here we see the big reveal of Ichigo's newest look after Candice destroys his royal realm robes in chapter 582. This is now the furthest point in the story the trailer has reached. Notably, this is the end of the trailer as it was currently playing out. All that follows now is a sizzle reel of fights we've previously seen, meaning this moment with Ichigo in 582 is as far as the trailer goes in terms of story, or is it? This is followed up by a really cool shot of Kangdu launching ice at Hitsugaya from chapter 553, a shot of Komamura's heart, and then Iba engaged with a soldat. And it's here that I wonder if the trailer goes just a bit further than we maybe think. Iba, of course, never engages a single enemy in the source material, so this is a new shot of him locked in combat with a soldat. Now, this could be from further in the story than 582. In fact, it could be from all the way in chapter 612, when Kisuke breaks down where each division currently is, and we see Iba and Seijin squaring off with several soldat. The anime may actually give us a small fight out of this moment, and perhaps even reveal Iba's Shikai at long last. However, I'm not sure this is from 612, mostly because that means the core will be going further than I expect it to. I'm still confident the core will end with chapter 611 and Yuhabaha stabbing Reo, but hey, maybe not. 
This shot of Eber could also be from an extension of chapter 558, when he rescues the downed Komamura. Perhaps they're immediately swarmed by Quincy's. This is then followed by a shot of Hinamori clasping her Zanpakuto, seemingly wincing in pain before looking on in shock. I mean, I have to assume this is during her battle with Bambietta, but I don't think this shot of her is in the source material at all. Or what if she's been attacked by a soldat and her shocked expression is when Shinji tells her to leave him in preparation for his Bankai. This is then followed by the shot of BG-9 unleashing his missiles at Soifon as per chapter 550, and then a new shot of Hisagi swinging Kazushini around. Now, considering Hisagi is looking a bit beaten up and is standing in a crater, I think this is the extension to his small battle with Masked Damasculine that I mentioned earlier. Following this, we get to see the massive explosion caused by Soifon's Bankai connecting with BG-9 in chapter 553, and then we're treated to a suitably creepy shot of Ukitake meditating at a shrine. This is another blink-and-you'll-miss-it moment in the source material, but it is there. In chapter 547, as the Vandenreich invasion begins, we see Kione and Sentaro outside the Seireite running to inform Ukitake, who we see is sitting at a mysterious shrine. Presumably this is him invoking the Kamikake, but I hope we get to see far more from him in general. Considering this shot of him is much closer to him than it appears in the source material, maybe they are adding a little more to this. Again, it's nearly impossible to say. Next, we have a totally new shot of Ikaku and Yumichika attacking together, flying towards the screen. Again, this could be part of an extension to their showdown with Master Masculine along with Hisagi. They're both fairly beaten up, so it's definitely possible, or it's from their later battle with Giselle and Zombietta, though I'm unsure of that since the trailer has so far completely avoided that part of the story. We then glimpse someone grinning in the darkness. Presumably, it's Zaraki, though he's missing his scar if it is, and his teeth look far more wolfish than normal, so this is a strange one. It could be human Komamura, but he never really smiles like this or ever at all. Zaraki feels like the most likely answer then, but I don't really know when this is. If it's when he grins, at Gremmy's incoming meteor, then where is the fiery lighting? Could this be a flashback, perhaps, to him hearing no Zarashi for the first time in the darkness of Muken? Following this, we have the last of the truly mysterious new shots, and the ones that are definitely spurring the most debate. We see a figure in what looks like a white Shihakusho carrying a sword through some water. Around him seem to be what look like black and white arrows buried in the ground, though I really don't know what the context is here at all. The prevailing theory is that this is meant to be none other than the villain of Can't Fear Your Own World, Tokinada Suna Yashiro, as he steals the Zanpak To Ikomikidomo from Oetsu's palace in the royal realm, thereby setting into motion the events of the light novel to come. I'll be completely honest though, I'm really not sure. It definitely could be him, and it would be really cool if it was, and of course Oetsu's palace is surrounded by water. But in this shot particularly, that doesn't look like Tokinada to me. Of course it's very grainy, but the figure's overall head shape and hair reminds me much more of the Soul King himself. Plus of course this grainy style of imagery was used previously in the trailer for, you guessed it, shots of the Soul King. Plus, Tokinada wears a very distinct segmented Hayori, and I'm not seeing that here either, really, especially in the first full-body shot. Another theory I've seen is that it's an ancestor of the noble houses bringing the blade they're going to use to dismember Rayo to the ceremony, which would also be pretty amazing. But now that we're here, let's talk about the integration of Can't Fear Your Own World and what it means for the future of the story and its adaptations. If this mysterious figure is Tokinada, then it would seem to indicate that they are going to adapt Can't Fear Your Own World. There's no other reason to include him. His story is totally separate from that of the Thousand Year Blood War arc. Him stealing Ikomikidomo serves no purpose in the Thousand Year Blood War outside of setting up the next arc. Then there's the fact they seem to be taking some of the biggest missing elements of Can't Fear Your Own World that really should have been in the Thousand Year Blood War arc in the first place and adding them here. Shinji's Bankai, Reio's history, the fact these all seem to be being added 
dilutes the overall importance of Can't For Your Own World. And as a direct sequel to the Thousand Year Blood War arc, part of the draw and purpose of that novel was to fill the gaps of the final arc that really should have been in the source material. And that makes me wonder if they're doing this because they have no plans to adapt Can't For Your Own World at all. If that's the case, then it makes no sense for this to be Tokinada. It's very interesting and definitely one of the things I'm absolutely most intrigued by. The best thing is, I'd love for it to really be any of these. If it's the Soul King in his prime, then that's giving me something I've personally wanted to see ever since we first laid eyes on him. If it's Tokinada, then that most likely confirms Can't Fear Your Own World, and that's also amazing. The more stories brought to life, the better it is for us Bleach fans. We then get an awesome shot of Yuhabaha looking out across multiple different holy forms activating at the same time, each of which is a different colour. This is from chapter 554, where all the Sternritter are able to release their power after losing the stolen Bankai. I kind of hope that this scene is handled a little better here, because it's weird in the source material. This scene is used to show that Kangdu and BG9 have survived, but nothing is ever done with it. The same goes for many of the other holy forms. They're just never seen in action. So here's hoping for something slightly different in the anime. As for who the forms belong to, it's nearly impossible to guess. The red is Bambietta, and the lime green is likely Candice. I theorised in my reaction that the white slash grey one is probably Kang Du due to the metal connection, which means BG9 is either the dark brown in the back or the orange closer to the front, as we know those fights take place pretty close together. It's good to see they've also fixed Yuhabaha's cape in this scene and made it black, whereas it was white in the original chapter, which looked very weird, though I think it was done on purpose. I don't think it was a mistake. I think he was just meant to have taken his cloak off, but Kubo must have hated that look as we never saw it again. The trailer ends with a sinister-looking Ichigo, perhaps completing his training with Ichibe, lowering his head to look at the camera with a fixed, confident stare. Again, this is all completely new, and I can't wait to see it. As the trailer ends, again with the colour I expect to be prevalent in the new opening, Ichigo says, I've been thinking about something since this battle started. If this is a battle between Soul Reapers and Quincy's, then that means that Ishida and I, and he's obviously going to say something like, are going to have to fight. It's hard to know who he's talking to here. If he's talking to Ichibe, then he doesn't yet know that Uryu has actually betrayed them. But this dialogue definitely seems to be setting up an inevitable showdown between the two of them, as does the key visual released for the second core. I think this has to be the new fight teased. Ichigo versus Uryu is something that absolutely should have happened in the source material, and it'll give Uryu a chance to actually prove his strength to everyone, like Yuhabaha said he would. And one final small detail, but the very end of the trailer details the cast list. And it seems like we have voice actors for every Sternritter now, including the missing Schutzstoffel members. Maybe we will get to see them earlier than we think, or this goes some way to reinforcing my belief the core will end with chapter 611. There are a few other interesting things here to note in the cast list too. The rest of the Vizards are finally confirmed to appear, as is Ganju Shiba, and unless they've added a new scene for him, Ganju doesn't reappear until chapter 598, so we're really closing in on that 611 endpoint. The cast list also spoils the reappearance of the Priveron Espada 2, and the fact that there are no full bringers on this list tells me that we won't reach as far as chapter 625. Anyway, that's an absolutely exhaustive look at the new trailer, every single frame combed over for details and speculation. What can we glean from this trailer overall? Well, it's heavily focused on the second invasion, of course, but even more specifically than that, it's focused on the first half of the second invasion, before the end of the first day. Some major fights are conspicuously absent. Rukia vs. Asnod, Kenpachi vs. Gremi, Mayuri vs. Giselle. These are all big battles that take place after the sun rises on the second day of fighting. And certainly where Rukia and Kenpachi's fights are concerned, they're some of the most anticipated of all. 
As it stands, this trailer doesn't really give us too many hints as to where this core will actually end, but based on everything I've said, everything I've predicted, and kind of tried to work out, I'm still standing by chapter 611 personally. So that's it for the video guys, I really hope you enjoyed it, I appreciate this was an absolutely mammoth video, but I really wanted to turn over every proverbial stone this trailer had to offer. Did I miss anything? please do let me know in the comments below. Let me know what you think about all of my theories surrounding the new content, surrounding the content that does seem to match the source material. I'd love to hear your thoughts down in the comments below. Make sure to hit subscribe if you haven't done already. Give the video a thumbs up if you enjoyed it. And until next time, I'll catch you later. And I'll see you then.